time, we are holding our first global symposium for our alumni and friends to share their knowledge and experiences on their work and innovations that have created positive social impact. Good morning, everybody. Xin chào, well, uh, welcome. To the, welcome to the first AI, AIT Alumni Association Global Symposium on Sustainable, Sustainable Technology Innovations with social impact in food, agriculture, and water, environment and climate change, and digital transformation and smart cities. We have been able to get the best possible resource persons from our AIT community and global leaders in their respective fields. I'm certain this will be an excellent opportunity to learn and exchange information. I hope this will be the doors, this will open the doors to connect, communicate, collaborate, and contribute for a better tomorrow. I wish all a safe and a secure tomorrow as well. Over to you. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you, um, Engineer um, Savindra Nathanado, for uh, your talk. And um, after this, so may I introduce the um, may I introduce. Professor Chan Thuk to have a talk on climate change and sustainable development case study in Vietnam. And um, Professor Chan Thuk is the chairman of the Vietnam Association of Meteorology and Hydrology, chairman of Vietnam National Committee for the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, and vice chairman of the Vietnam Advisory Council on Climate Change. He has over 30 years experience in hydro hydrometeorology, environment, climate change, and disaster risk reduction, including the prepar preparation of Vietnam's national strategy for climate change, national action plan to respond to climate change, nationally determined contribution, national adaptation plan, climate change scenarios for Vietnam, climate change impact, and vulnerability assessment. And uh, he made the guideline for mainstreaming climate change into development plan. So please, Professor Thuk Chen. Uh, good morning, friends and colleagues. My name is Chen Thuk. I did my master and doctorate at the LIT uh, from 1985 to 1990. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have a chance to meet you at this symposium of LIT alumni. I would like to share with you uh, a presentation on climate change and sustainable development. That is the linkage between climate change adaptation, greenhouse gas mitigation, and sustainable development goal. Uh, since uh, 1850 up to now, uh, global emission increased, increased, and increased a lot. Uh, up to now, uh, the, uh, the big emitter uh, in the past, emission mainly come from the developed country uh, like uh, the US, the EU, uh, Japan, etc. But recently, uh, there are some big emitters uh, like China, uh, India, Brazil, etc. So the, the negotiation going on, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has been uh, established and uh, signed in 1992, but it took more than 20 years uh, to implement that or to, to make it in uh, operation. So after more than 20 years, the party has signed the Paris Agreement in 2015. But then it took another more than five years to have the detailed uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement. This year we have it, uh, Glasgow Pact in uh, 2021. The Paris Agreement set in the goal for temperature, try to limit it at two, uh, two degrees Celsius and uh, up to 1.5 degrees Celsius only. The mitigation goal is to reduce emission to 40 gigatons 
with the peak global emission as soon as possible. Uh, the agreement also set the adaptation goal, including adaptive capacity, resilient vulnerability, loss and damage. Uh, about the finance, the developed country had pledged uh, to mobilize about 100 billion US dollars per year till 2025 and higher after 2025. It also set up technology development and transfer capacity building, a five-year cycle of action that is the national determined contribution NDC. A five-year global stock to evaluate the, the effort, the global effort, uh, compared to the goal of uh, two degrees or 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, finally, they also have the transparency of action and support from developed country to developing country. And uh, this year we have a breakthrough negotiation in uh, Glasgow, uh, that is the Glasgow Pact in COP26. Uh, with a firm basis of delivering the Paris Agreement, a detailed reporting requirement for related support, a robust rule for international carbon markets, a clear, clear five-year NDC ambition cycle, um, more urgency for this uh, time. Uh, increased climate finance pledge. Uh, however, people said that uh, it is, uh, we don't know that, a low trust in keeping the promise from the developed country, especially on uh, the loss and damage. Increased long-term ambition with the focus on 1.5 degree target. However, there is a very weak language on fossil fuels in the short-term emission gap. Uh, now the short-term emission gap up to 2030 is still remain, but uh, we hope that it will get uh, smaller. However, according to the analysis from the climate action tracker, there are still gaps remain. And with this pledge, the, we cannot keep the temperature lower than two degrees Celsius. The next step of negotiation is that we have to start the Article 6 as soon as possible and the CDM transition for the period of 2022 to 2030. Uh, for next year, COP27 in Europe, uh, the main focus is on adaptation and loss and damage. And into 2023, COP28, about global stock take to evaluate what we have done, what we are doing, and what we need to do in order to keep the temperature by the end of the century lower than two degrees Celsius or to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. So for the, 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 the bigger picture on the global goal for sustainable development is set up uh, 17 goals and 169 target. What is the linkage between climate change action, adaptation mitigation with the global goal? We try to make a study on the co-benefit uh, and a scenery between climate change action and the sustainable development goal. The three pillars of the action, including mitigation, adaptation and development. For the development and mitigation, we, we try to find the potential for emission reduction at the mitigation side, and it contributes to the development or development goal. By low carbon technology, low emission technology, determining technology needs. Uh, for adaptation side, we will try to resolve climate impact to contribute to the uh, development goal uh, by means of uh, climate risk management, 
adaptation capacity building, reduce vulnerability. And for mitigation and adaptation, uh, we will have to look at mitigation investment or, or benefit to climate resilience. A mitigated benefit from adaptation mitigation, adaptive benefit from mitigation investment, and adaptation investment without increase uh, the uh, climate change emission. Uh, I will based on the three pillar of this uh, from my presentation. With it, uh, I have uh, seven items. First, policy review. Second, assessment framework. Uh, thirdly, benefit of climate change adaptation, greenhouse gas mitigation to the development. Four is co-benefit of climate change adaptation and greenhouse gas mitigation. The fifth is scenery and economic co-benefit of climate change adaptation, development, and mitigation. The sixth is contribution of climate change adaptation, greenhouse gas mitigation to sustainable, sustainable development goal. And finally, with some uh, general comments from me. Uh, for the NDC, normally we have uh, the element like this, uh, mitigation, adaptation, and the impact on social, economic, and environment of the climate change measures. Uh, if we do something on mitigation, on adaptation, it has the impact. Uh, maybe it's positive or negative. We try to, uh, to make use of the positive impact and mitigate the negative impact. Uh, engagement with the private sector, strengthening assessment and tracking, and reconnect benefit and synergy of the NDC measure, uh, including between adaptation and mitigation. The, I take case study of um, NDC of Vietnam in the mitigation, um, in greenhouse gas mitigation, we have uh, 52 options on energy, agriculture, Lulucia, and waste. In adaptation, there are 39 actions on natural resource and environment, agriculture and rural development, construction, infrastructure, disaster risk reduction, and health. With that, we will try to find the impact on development uh, on climate-related uh, issue, on economic, on social, and on environment and institution and policy. Uh, in, with regard to climate, uh, we consider emission intensity reduction, disaster reduction, enhanced resilience for economic uh, increased production, productivity, facilitate development of new technology, facilitate business investment, or social increase employment opportunity, improve health, enhance awareness and climate change and sustainable development, reduce poverty, ensure food and livelihood security, increase social equality, improve skill and capacity of employees. For the environment, uh, reduce pollution and uh, improve air quality, reduce pollution and improve soil quality, uh, water resource management, improve quality of ecosystem service, biodiversity and conservation. Uh, with uh, institution and policy, support policy related to climate change, uh, related social economic development, promote participation and coordination mechanism mechanism of stakeholder in climate change. We have from the side of uh, adaptation mitigation uh, measure, we have the indicator and uh, through questionnaire for stockholder taking, we find the uh, economic and social uh, and co-benefit, social, economic, environment, and institution policy co-benefit. Then the result uh, are rate 
at uh, very low, low, medium, high, and very high. Uh, similarly, contribution of climate change adaptation mitigation to sustainable development goal on the uh, water resource sector, agriculture, food security, forestry, fishery, energy, transportation, and health. Uh, then consider with 17 uh, sustainable development goal. The total impact on each um, sustainable development goal is determined as a total impact of each sector factor. Uh, again, are read at uh, no impact, low impact, medium, and high impact, and very high impact. The identified area that uh, climate change respond to support for achievement uh, sustainable development goal. Uh, take example as investment to take advantage of the opportunity that climate change can bring. The results show that the benefit of climate change adaptation to development uh, are added for each sector from natural resource and environment, agriculture and rural development, construction. Uh, then the uh, benefit of climate, economic, social, environment policy for infrastructure for disaster risk reduction for health sector as shown in this uh, screen it is seen that the benefit of climate change adaptation um, action in uh, institutional and policy aspect are already high guess compared to other uh, at the value of 3.3 Benefit of climate change adaptation in climate related aspect uh, 218, economic 212, social 217, institutional and policy. Uh, it is seen that climate change adaptation in agriculture and rural development sector are rated as the highest among other. Uh, the benefit of greenhouse gas mitigation to development, including uh, climate, economic, social, environment, and policy institution for the sector of agriculture, waste, LULUCF, and energy. It is seen that uh, the implementation of climate change adaptation uh, bring benefit in mitigation mainly related to forest plantation, res uh, restoration, reduction of deforestation and degradation, forest protection, uh, and, and plan new plant uh, plantation, and the improve improvement of coastal forest, including uh, mangrove. Economic benefit are creating business and investment opportunity to attract investment in climate change response. Uh, that is to promoting development of infrastructure, economic sector, efficient and sustainable use of uh, natural resources. For the social uh, benefit, it can uh, create job, more job and income for the local people. That is to contribute to poverty reduction and sustainable development. Uh, for the contribution of greenhouse gas mitigation to climate change adaptation in energy sector, it provides energy security, uh, create investment environment, improve labor condition, job creation, income increase. For agriculture sector, it increased the climate resilience for plant and animal, save agriculture, diversify and sustainable good. Job uh, security, poverty reduction, and food security, health benefit, and reduce pollution. Uh, in the waste sector, it reduce costs associated with the environment, ensure health condition, job creation, uh, income increase, limitation of pollution. For the LULUCF sector, it can bring economic benefit by generating for it, uh, create job, ecological balance and biodiversity, protect the environment and especially disaster risk reduction. 
Uh, this uh, graph shows show some benefit of climate change adaptation, uh, development, and greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, similarly, this shows the uh, benefit of greenhouse gas mitigation to development and climate change adaptation. For the contribution of climate change adaptation to sustainable development, it is shown in uh, this graph uh, for infrastructure, disaster risk reduction, and for health. Uh, we can summarize that climate change adaptation in the NDC have the largest contribution to the goal 13 on respond to climate change and natural disaster, and the goal 11 on sustainable urban and rural development. The contribution of greenhouse gas mitigation to sustainable development goal for the overall, the highest contribution to goal number 17 on global partner and goal seven on sustainable energy and goes eight on sustainable economy. It is seen that uh, for the energy, the highest contribution to go seven and 17, agriculture, highest contribution to go number two and number nine. Lulucia, the highest contribution is to go uh, 15, and for the waste sector, I guess contribution to go seven and 17. Uh, some conclusion or remark can drawn from uh, the study as follow. The core benefits should be used as a criteria for the selection of adaptation measures and mitigation option. Uh, of course, together with feasibility and sustainability, cost benefit analysis and transparency formational change. Contribution of greenhouse gas mitigation option to climate change adaptation is rated at high score. Contribution of climate change measure to greenhouse gas mitigation is rated at, at uh, medium score. Policy to promote investment, mobilize resources, or implementing mitigation option can bring benefit not only for the imitation of commitment on greenhouse gas mitigation, but also promoting economic development in the green and sustainable direction. So climate change action, including adaptation and mitigation in the NDC should be revealed in the direction of co-benefit uh, among adaptation, development, and mitigation. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests, for your attention. So after this, I present to you Professor Mohan Munasinghe to have a talk on sustainable development, climate change, and energy integrated solutions. And to ensure the best presentation from our speaker, please turn off all your mic and redo un to redo unexpected background noises. And um, Professor Mohan Munasinghe is the founder chairman of the Munasinghe Institution of Development the MIND in Colombo, Vice Chair of the United Nations Inter Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, who shared the 2007 Nobel Prize for Peace and the 2021 Blue Planet Prize, Laurent, also called the Environmental Nobel Prize. The heads of five countries have presented Hagi's national award to him. He's also the Chairman, Presidential Expert Commission on Sustainable Sri Lanka 2030 Vision, Distinguished Guest Professor and Peking University, China, and Honorary Senior Advisor of the Government of Sri Lanka. He has also earned the postgraduate degree in Engineering Physics and Development Economics from Cambridge University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA, and McGill University and Concordia University in Canada. Professor Munasinghe is world renowned for developing the integrated, transdisciplinary, sustainable, sustainable methodology for sustainable development. He has authored over 120 books and 400 technical papers on economics, 
sustainable development, climate change, power, energy, water resources, transport, uh, environment, disaster, and information technology. He's a fellow of several internationally recognized academic of science and served on the editorial board of over a dozen professional journals. So now we come to the uh, to the talk of uh, Professor Mo Mohan Munasinghe. So please. Are you born from Sri Lanka? Xin chào, greetings. Congratulations to AITAA on holding their first global symposium and exhibition on the important theme, sustainable technology innovations. Thanks to the organizer for inviting me, especially my colleague engineer, Shavi Fernando. I regret I cannot join you in beautiful Vietnam due to COVID-19. I wish you all success in your deliberations. I will talk about integrated solutions to two major issues that humanity faces, sustainable development and climate change. We are striving to achieve sustainability in the 21st century by harmonizing economic prosperity, social progress, and environmental protection. The balanced inclusive green growth BIGG path based on the sustainomics framework shows us the way forward. Let us act now together. Let me talk to you about sustainable development and climate change integrated solutions with balanced inclusive green growth. Which critical global problems does humanity face? There are many global issues that block sustainable development, including poverty and inequality, resource shortages, energy, water, financial sector collapses, pandemics like COVID, conflict, insecurity, weak leadership, unmanaged trade, and finally, of course, climate change, which is the ultimate threat multiplier, worsening all the other issues. These multiple threats are interrelated and synergistic, but our responses as stakeholders are uncoordinated and piecemeal. We need to take decisive action. Robust, integrated, and comprehensive strategy is needed. What key concepts to move forward towards the 21st century Earth eco civilization? In 1992, at the Rio Earth Summit, I presented a framework called Sustainomics and the Balanced Inclusive Green Growth Path. These will facilitate implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The first core concept of Sustainomics is to harmonize the Sustainable Development Triangle for balance and integration. We have the economic side, for prosperity, to raise the poor out of poverty. We need the social side to make sure there's empowerment and inclusion. And we have the environmental side to make sure that natural resources are protected and there is not excessive pollution. The uh, three elements must be harmonized so that any topic like energy or climate change or sustainability can be addressed in a balanced way. The second core concept is called climb the mountain, making development more sustainable with empowerment, action, and foresight. You see, sustainable development is like a mountain peak that is covered with clouds. But if we walk one step at a time, eventually we will reach the peak because many unsustainable activities are easy to identify. When we leave this room, we can uh, lock off the light. We can close a tap. We can plant a tree. And we can do this at a personal level, at a company level, at the level of cities, and so on. The third core concept is to transcend boundaries in our own minds, which is what you're doing, innovation. Values are particularly unsustainable uh, if they are unethical. They must be replaced. We need to think in terms of multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary analysis. We need to think in terms of global scale, not just your own neighborhood. Decades or centuries rather than days or months. 
and we need to work with all stakeholders so that government and business and civil society can cooperate to work together like this. This will strengthen leadership and good governance to protect this sustainable development space. And civil society and business are actually maybe even pushing government to do the right thing. And AIT can help to build this framework. The fourth core concept is very simple. It's just implement, implement, implement. We have many case studies and best practices examples of these analytical tools. Just get in touch with me and I will let you have them. The framework for the 21st century eco-civilization starts with ethical values and focusing on things like happiness and well-being, not just material consumption for GNP. I work, for example, with the Kingdom of Bhutan on this concept. And the UN 2030 Agenda and 17 SDG uh, are the key. They are universal, integrated. All countries have endorsed this. It's a framework to monitor progress, but must be prioritized to meet each country's needs. Now, what urgent changes are needed to restore the unsustainable systems that may collapse any day? This is environment climate risk measured by per capita greenhouse gas emissions. This is economic progress measured by per capita income. If you're a poor country, you're at point A. If you're a rich country, you're at point C. You're above the safe limit in terms of emissions, but you are also rich. And middle countries are somewhere in between. Now, this triangle here is not harmonized. There is no balance. And that's why you have a red X. Now, the first step in this process is called green growth to balance environmental damage and economic development. Rich countries can continue to have a good life, but they can transform their economies along the green growth path so that they consume much less of natural resources. And we have the technologies and the methods to do that. If you are in the middle group, you should not be following the profligate path of the rich. We have this green growth tunnel and countries like Sri Lanka and China and other Asian countries can reach the same point by rebalancing economy and environment. And technical innovation will actually facilitate this green growth tunnel. The third step is very key, and that is balanced inclusive green growth. We need to integrate the sustainable development triangle by choosing pro poor inclusive BIGG paths. And that is this BIGG path. So, balanced inclusive green growth is the way the post-COVID world will go. And this works not just only for greenhouse gas emissions, but for food, water, energy, any other resource. If you look just at the area of uh, sustainable consumption and food, we see that one third of the world's food production is lost or wasted, mainly in homes in Western countries, 30 to 50%, and yet 800 million people are starving. Here is an affluent family in Europe. They can have the same affluent food, but with less packaging and less wastage. And that is this part of the curve. And look at this poor family. This is their food for a week in sub-Saharan Africa. We have to raise them out of poverty. So they, they are not reducing their consumption, but along the green growth path uh, so that uh, it is an ethical and sustainable path as shown here. There is also sustainable production, which is the other side of the coin. And I've given lectures and workshops on business sustainability to CEOs and senior managers of these top multinationals, for example, BASF, chemicals, Tesco, supermarkets, the retail stores like Unilever, Coca-Cola, and so on, OPEC for energy, Petrobras, Sign Derby plantations, Novozymes for biotech, mining, 
and even wine producers. And they have all agreed, the top management, that sustainability and triple bottom line is the way of the future. But resource efficiency is a win-win starting point because when you use resources more efficiently, your costs go down, your profits go up, and you save the environment. And of course, ethical values are the key to long-term sustainability. Now let's move to the IPCC. This is a summary of their key findings. Global warming is certainly proven and it's human emissions that have caused the problem. In the future, climate change can cause great harm and the poor will suffer most. But the solution is to integrate climate change adaptation and mitigation into sustainable development strategy. So sustainable development is the best way. And this is how the IPCC's thinking and analysis have evolved because I worked more, more than 20 years in the IPCC and ended up as the vice chair. That is in pre 2000, we thought or the scientists at the time, the senior scientists thought of climate change and development as separate topics. And this was dominated, this period was dominated more by pure climate scientists. But in the, in the 1990s, a group of us, including myself, got together and we pushed development and we showed that climate and development are in, in, in fact closely linked and it is an integrated climate sustainable development strategy that can work. And this is the current view that still prevails. And the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the IPCC for this insight. So what are the two way links that are important? You have different socioeconomic development paths which are causing greenhouse gas emissions. That is, increasing the atmospheric concentrations, and that is through the process of radiative forcing, disturbing the climate system in the climate domain. And of course, the climate system strikes back with temperature rise, sea level rise, precipitation changes, and so on, various stressors, which will disturb human and natural systems. And in turn, that will change our socioeconomic development paths. So you have a complete cycle, but this is not a very good feedback loop. So how do we change this in the sustainable development domain? Two things. We have adaptation, which is a filter which will reduce the impacts of the stressors so that human and natural systems can survive. And there's mitigation, which is a filter which reduces, it squeezes down the emissions. And these are the two methods that, that human beings can respond. So integrating climate change policies into national sustainable development strategy involves making the decision makers realize that climate change is a key element. So here is our modeling space, but we have to understand that climate change is only one out of 17 holistic SDGs. So we have to worry about the others as well, the energy, health, agriculture, industry, and so on. So for example, if you show how climate change impacts on agriculture, the agriculture minister will take notice. And similarly, that is how you integrate climate policies into national strategy. Now, this is what happens, for example, with cities. This is with temperature rise and extreme weather. This is Zhangzhou in China in 2021, just a few months ago. Here are cars floating like dead fish in the river because uh, one year's worth of rain fell in three days, Une totally unexpected. And the city's flood system was not uh, up to the mark. Here is what happened in Lytton, Canada, also a few months ago. This is the town before, this is the town after. In one day, it was burned to the ground because they had the highest recorded temperatures. So world is urbanizing fast. Future cities can be made more sustainable and climate resilient. And now we come to a concept of climate justice, energy poverty and inequity to show how these are all connected economic, environmental, and social goals. 
For example, if you look at energy pricing sustainably, economic efficiency tells us to maximize growth, you need high prices to reflect long run incremental or marginal costs because energy costs are rising. This is this part of the curve, economic only. Environmental side tells us that you need green energy, you need to have higher prices even more because this energy is damaging the environment. So you, you add pollution taxes, carbon taxes, and so on. And that is uh, this part of the curve that you see here, the green growth tunnel and so on, right? And the third element is social equity, because raising energy prices alone will meet economic and environmental goals, but it will destroy the poor. They are deprived of basic energy needs, you're worsening energy poverty. So you have to have subsidized prices to meet basic, basic energy needs. And for this, we have, for example, in electricity block pricing structures with subsidized minimum use for poor homes and so on. And that is the BIGG part. That is how BIGG works to give you sustainable energy pricing. Finally, I give you a very quick example of BIGG application, again, to balance economic, social, and environmental criteria with a transdisciplinary multi-criteria analysis of hydro projects. And it involves all of these transdisciplinary integrated subjects, engineering, mathematics, computer science, hydrology, ecology, soil sciences, all of these are in this one study, which I'm going to summarize for you in two minutes. First, the overview of the study. We look at how energy affects all three dimensions of sustainable development, and we will use multi-criteria analysis. So the economic variable is electricity supply cost per unit of greenhouse gas or ton of carbon avoided because this hydro energy will displace fossil fuels. The social is the number of people displaced or resettled because hydro projects may have a small dam. The environmental side is the biodiversity loss because of the vegetation cover. Now this is the first graph that I show you, which are the three criteria which are plotted as bar charts. This is the cost, the price. This is the resettlement. And this one is the biodiversity loss. Now, if you look at this and if a decision maker sees this, they can't, they can't choose among these because it looks very confusing. So we replot this. This is your skill as an analyst. Here is economic cost on this axis, social people resettled on this axis, and the biodiversity going that way. Now, this immediately resolves many issues. Okay, and the first is these are lose lose options. The points that are furthest from the origin have high cost, they have a lot of biodiversity loss, and a lot of people resettled. So, we throw out these projects. The ones closest to the origin are good because they are the best of the lot. So without having to value biodiversity and people resettled and all this, you can use this quick diagram to balance the three with multi-criteria analysis. Finally, let me end with a very quick thing about personal choices that you need, we need to harmonize ourselves before we can harmonize the earth. You have your work and income and job satisfaction in the mind, but that's not enough. You need health, fitness, a clean environment for the body, and you need family, friends, and community for the social side. And that will make an ethical, well-balanced person with a balanced personal sustainable development triangle. But watch out for potential surprises. We have climate change, uh, pandemics, resource shortages, economic crises, social unrest, and also technological disruption. But innovative thinking like yours will help to build resilience and help us survive in a dynamically changing world. And out of the 12 potentially economic disruptive technologies, I tell you that the top eight here are all digital technologies. 
So we have, they are very helpful, but they can also disrupt us a lot. Optimistic final message for Sri Lanka and the world. We have multiple problems that pose serious challenges, but the problems can be addressed with this integrated framework of sustainomics and big. If we start now, we need to transform governance systems. Uh, we need to work with business and civil society to manage the post-COVID recovery. And I'm sure AIT and its graduates can lead the way forward in devising 21st century paths for sustainable development in Asia and the whole world. I will end with something from our own past in Sri Lanka. It's an ancient Pali blessing, which says, may the rains come in time with the environment, may the harvest be bountiful, which is economy, may the people be happy and contented, may the king be righteous, which is the society. So even in ancient times, my ancestors knew about the sustainable development triangle. I'm just trying to rediscover it today. So if you want to learn more, my institute, the Munising Institute for Development, does this work of making development more sustainable. We have awards and scholarships. You do applied research, engage in private public policy, and we have many books and publications. You can also visit my website. Stuti. Cham on ban. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mohan Munasinghe, for uh, the presentation. So now we may introduce the talk by Dr. Nick Vias on digital transformation and smart cities. Dr. Nick Vias is a practitioner in operation management and organizational excellence through the application of blended quality management. AI, LM, uh, ML, RPA, blockchain, and data analytics received his Doctor of Education from USC with his published dissertation of conceptualization of higher education excellence system, HES, the use of advanced data analytics and blended quality management, a subject matter expert in end-to-end -end global supply chain management. And uh, Dr. Vias has led business Transformation uh, business transformation for Fortune 100 companies. SUSC um, executive director, co founder, the director of MS, GSCM, and an assistant professor. He was presented at the Golder Apple Award for Teaching Excellence and recognized as a supply chain leader for the Apex Excellence Award. And as a top leader, he spoke at the conference on global trade, disruptive technology, and GSCM. So please, we come to the talk by Dr. Nick Spires. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to this amazing opportunity to speak to you about the future of global supply chain 2025 outlook, driving supply chain sustainability through decoupling, and not deglobalization. I'm Professor Nick Vias, uh, the founding executive director for Kendrick Global Supply Chain Management Institute and academic director for Masters of Science in Global Supply Chain Management at the University of Southern California. It's a privilege to be with you to share the state of the supply chain. Uh, and I'll try to walk you through this journey of not only how we got here, where are we, how long do we anticipate to be here, and then some of the most important piece, the horizon scan over the next five years. So if we think about the supply chain, I think we are at the inflection point on the supply chain disruption. March, 2020, when the onslaught of disruption started on the supply side, specifically triggering shutdown in Asia, leading up to disruption of COVID-19, across 156 countries, 
every imaginable continent, every imaginable neighborhood, municipality, state, country, irrespective of their socioeconomic status, irrespective of their prosperity or boundaries, every single one of us were disrupted. This was a pandemic of the century, taught us how fragile the supply chain networks were. But in the backdrop of COVID disruption, we have had tremendous friction, specifically on the trade side, between Europe and China, US and China. And a lot of this conversation truly triggered a policy decision way before even the COVID started. And COVID just created sort of a, a catalyst for these conversations to accelerate and become part of the main focus of policy decisions globally. So this decoupling, as I define here, as to how do we build the supply chains of the future where they're not long, extreme, and not one country or one region specific, but rather they're short. They're much more agile, much more resilient, much more sustainable. So today I will walk you through my perspective in this space. So if you think about the decoupling, just sort of a zooming out about 10,000 feet, you would realize the decoupling is not a political exercise. It is not about retracting back to the borders or stopping the participation in the global economy. Far from it, decoupling is about how do we ensure the future pandemic, natural disaster, and geopolitical tension does not create the disruption, the level that we have experienced in the recent years. So if you look at this chart, and this is just an example of a few SKUs, few items, we realize over the last three decades, the world became very dependent on a one country centric manufacturing node. So even though the last five to 10 years, the conversation about the trade deficits and some of the conversation about China plus strategy, China continued to provide a large percentage of our manufacturing capacity. While China itself realized that they need to divest and they started to invest in the ASEAN countries and open up the manufacturing capacity, a lot of the supply chain nodes and the networks were still heavily dependent on China. So some of the key issues that we have to look at it, and let's bring that up in the front, is IMF has slashed the 2021 growth by almost a full percentage. But this is the biggest reduction by any G7 economy. We also see increased border controls and mobility restrictions continue to happen where we have not really opened up the borders for travel just yet. Although it's beginning to now uh, open up uh, in recent days, but that continues to uh, be a question of how long that will last and will we be subjected to another variant. And then we start to focus here in America and some of the European countries. But we have a huge deficit of human capital. Shortage of commercial driver, uh, the labor participation in supply chain. So we are seeing incredible amount of bottlenecks across the supply chain networks here at home and some of the points in global supply chain. So we need to focus now on what is the 2025 outlook. And what I'd like to propose to you is that there is a tremendous likelihood, some through the corporations and companies adopting to this new supply chain structure of being able to have shorter supply chains close to the customer within the region, 
and, and then ensure that those shorter supply chains are not counterproductive to our globalization. So we need to continue to be global, but rather than having a one long stream, we'll have multiple short stream uh, network of supply chains that would cater to the customers in each of those regions. So think of this as independent and interdependent network nodes. So for example, in the US, we're likely to see the supply chain of the future would be decoupled node where some key manufacturing will be either onshore or near shore to Mexico, Dominican Republic, and Latin America for the region in Americas. And we may have a, another node in Asia. I mean, Asia may even have two nodes, one from Southeast Asia and one China plus, uh, Greater China. Or one could be ASEAN and one could be Asia Pac. So you can li you're likely to see this kind of a model in which especially the high-end manufacturing, the capital intensive manufacturing will find its ways to this opportunity. So you may wonder that if I'm talking about decoupling, and we're clear now we're not deglobalizing the economy because we have done incredible job of connecting our economy globally. So then how do we do it? So what I call this framework is optimal operation, technical, infrastructure, management, advocacy, and legal. And we need each of these components to play itself through when we execute this idea of decoupling. So let's talk about operational. The localized supply chain hubs will have to be looked at it as, how do I find the human capital first? Do I have a skill set workforce? What is my supplier ecosystem? Because you simply cannot have a decoupled supply chain close to your customer unless your suppliers also are in that local ecosystem. Do we have enough storage and transportation options within that local network? And what about the regulatory policies? Are they business friendly? So these are the issues that we're going to have to sort of learn to identify. We have to ensure that operationally that the effective supply chain operations uh, will require planning, will require careful balance between uh, some of the best lean practices we have built and also strike the balance between agility and resilience. At the end of the day, the operational capability will be as such that we will not only be single dimensional like we have been over the last 30, 40 years, focusing only on the cost, but rather sustainability and agility. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs>